truly the height of versatility and also a test of skill when it comes to playing and building a deck. Um, when you're playing a deck that has so many different lines of play, so many different small choices, which counterspell do I play to counter this? Which one is more or less situational? You really need to learn your deck and, I hate to say it, but vibe with it in order to win. Yeah, um, by the way, uh, Stenif Saf Sifka just has the combo in hand. Yeah, oh, I, I see. Not two blue mana yet. But yeah, there's a Thassa's Oracle, and there's two Tainted Packs, which, by the way, having both of them in hand is even better, because it means you can search out another card first. Uh, now it's just all about getting a little bit more blue mana. And there's a Scry on the Temple, there's a Scry... Oh, oh there's the Drowned Catacomb. Does now it even it's have to, to come down to... <laughs> it's just perfect. It's just, and there's so little like interaction the... in the first game. I mean, There's... I would be shocked if Sifka just doesn't go for it here. It's... Oh, and yeah, Riku's going to probably tap out for the solve the equation. Yeah, so that's it. We're done. That's that's game one. As as long as uh, Sifka holds full control and, uh, you know, expertly executes the <laughs> Thassa's Oracle, we're going to be seeing a quick win here. And that's really the strength of a combo that can go off so fast. We've seen some other turn three, turn four combos in historic. Uh, I think in the last major historic tournaments, Neoform combo was a pretty big contender. But here we have this much more secure combo going with the Oracle and the Tainted Pact. So let's see it happen. Yep. Easy game. You let the, you resolve the Oracle. With the trigger on the stack, you put the Tainted Pact, you can go and get yourself a coffee because the rope burning makes you automatically decline. And uh, yeah, you win. When you come back for, from uh, making your coffee. Huh. I mean, you, it is best to do this. Uh, it looks like Riku is not interested in just trying to burn out the clock to get more game time, uh, which is very kind. Thank you, Riku, for not dragging things out. In a competitive format like this, very often what you want to do is you want to force your opponent to use up as much of their round timer as you can. But it looks like Riku is here for some fair Grixis packed gameplay and is just going to let that resolve and concede. Yep. Um, for the postboard games, not a ton changes, right? Just bad interaction becomes good interaction. You'll notice, by the way, that uh, Riku Kumagai actually takes out the Billful Mastery. Um, it's just not a real... I mean, it's fine, but it's not really the best way to stop the combo in the mirror match, especially with interaction. On the other side, you see uh, Stanislav Sivka boarding in that pack rat, and that can turn your, your game plan from being kind of this combo deck into a control deck where you have pack rat and you're forcing your opponent to take make a move before it's the right time. Yes, and both players did take out their board wipe. Uh, languish, they have Ritual of Soot, I believe, in their sideboards, but of course they're not bringing it in for this, which means that having a board full of creatures, like pack rats, could win the game. Oh yeah, I mean, we saw pack rat do incredible work work against the Jeskai deck earlier, uh, with Luris of the Dream Den making it come back, so uh, it is good in these matchups, because it's an alternative win condition, and that can matter a lot. And we see some great hand hate here on Riku's hand. Uh, Riku has both a Duress and an Inquisition of Kozilek. Yeah, so we're going to see one of those fired off. And the choice really is between that Tainted Pack and uh, the uh, the Saloon Division. So, so like, normally you'd want to take Tainted Pack. It's just that this is Sifka's only blue source. Uh, decides to take the Inquisition here if... If the belief is I'm going to take the Tainted Pack later, uh, so I'm protecting my own Inquisition. There's also yeah. not a ton of discards, so you know Sivka might not lead out with the with the Vision here, which uh, you know because you might draw another blue source, you might want to use it as a spell. And that is a good land to get on top, by the way. You were mentioning before, both no blue sources other than the Salindi Vision, but also uh, Sifka was missing untapped mana. The Salindi Vision can only come in tapped, and that Dragon Skull Summit, unless it sees 
a mountain or a swamp will be coming in tapped. And here's the Inquisition of Kozlik, a follow-up from that first discard spell. This is another opportunity to hit the Salindi Vision or the Tainted Pact. Uh, all of these cards... Very good to get rid of. And that's the Tainted Pact gun. There's only two of them in the deck, but of course, Underwood Reach able to bring it back from the graveyard. And hello there, Kroxa, forcing a discard. So, yep, Kroxa is a nice alternative plan, but uh, this card, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name. I know it's Glimpse, but. Um, Essentially, you know, the the that card advantage is something we've seen uh, earlier in the league weekends, especially I'm trying to remember the first ones with uh, Battle for Zendikar when that was the new set. Um, or Zendikar Rising Robber. Sorry, Battle for Zendikar being another way. And, and it was so good against uh, cards like Croxa or in playing these long control games because of the escape. So this was a stellar card against the Rogue deck. So uh, I like the addition of uh, of the card. Because it allows you against the Rodex to uh, to kind of have a freebie, and you can always cycle it. Is that the uh, glimpse of freedom that was in the hand? Yes, I was trying to remember the name as well. Yeah. Oh, yep, that's it. It's, it's got these beautiful, like, swirling pools of water in it. It's very yeah. cool. And uh, we're seeing tutors all around here. There's also a groom tutor now in Sifka's hand. But uh, Sifka, with both the Vision and the Supreme Will, gets to operate at instant speed. No need to play the Grim Tutor right away. You you want to play your kind of uh, hard tutors. That is the tutor that can get anything rather than the soft tutors. So top of the library cards later. You want the full amount of information, especially when you need both combo pieces. And here's the Salundi Vision, which operates a lot like Supreme Will, except it does not have a counter spell mode. Yeah. I really, I, lo I love Supreme Will as a card, by the way. The fact that it's never dead and allows you either the selection or the interaction is really nice. Uh, gotta love Supreme William. So here there is the choice between Counterspells and Brainstorm. Uh, that not taking Pact of Negation is interesting. Clearly Sifka wants to find the pieces to the combo. Um, but Pact of Negation is an excellent way to protect your combo on the turn it comes down because it is a free counter spell and you don't have to worry about paying five mana if you win the game that turn that's true the the problem with pact of negation is when you look at this game sifka still trying to assemble the combo and brainstorm plus grim tutor is a you know a really powerful interaction to sculpt your hand you also have brainstorm plus uh, supreme will which allows you to dig deeper into your library um, so I'm not too surprised there by the choice. Um, Sifka is kind of behind in terms of uh, assembling the combo pieces. So getting the Pact of Negation that sometimes can work uh, in disrupting the combo, but honestly, you still need that fifth card. Uh, sorry, that fifth land. So I, I like I like taking the Brainstorm and trying to set up. So here we're going to see Grim Tutor looking at some choices for hand hate here. Going for Thoughtseize because it can't hit any non-land. The other choice there was a Duress, which can only hit non-creature non-lands. Get rid of that Tainted Pact. That's the card you're afraid of. And it means that even if Riku drew one of the other combo piece, uh, you know, the other combo piece, Fossil's Oracle, you'd still be quite far behind. And it is risky to use that Wish Claw Talisman for anything other than your winning turn. It can only be activated at sorcery speed, but it is a Wish card, or sorry, it's a Tutor card, really, um, that will allow your opponent to search their library on the next turn. Right. And uh, when, you, when you're uh, searching, you know, when you're playing the Mirror Match, giving them that card on their turn is a really, really big cost. Right? It's like, oh god, what if they drew the what if they drew the oracle and all they need now is the pact? That that is what's very scary, especially if they're at, say, five mana. Yeah. But one thing that makes Wishcloth Talisman so powerful is that you can split the mana, right? It's not if you compare it to Grim Tutor, right? Both cards roughly cost the same to get a card, free mana. 
The difference with Wishclaw Talisman is you can upfront two mana and then pay one later. It's, it is actually seeing quite a bit of legacy play just because of that fact. The fact that you can split over two turns, you can play it on turn two. And then on your combo turn, you get to tutor for a single mana, which is an incredibly powerful effect. Drawing a fifth land here. Does have the ability to escape Kroxa, interestingly enough. But there are some valuable cards in the graveyard, so that may not be Skiska, Sifka's favorite choice here. There is the ability to brainstorm first, though, with that Drowned Catacomb in hand. Well, lots of lands there. Spire Bluff Canal definitely coming in tapped at this point of the game. And some good graveyard hate in Cling to Dust. Um, I wonder if uh, Sifka decides to return the Croxa. Like, yeah, you do have to burn some cards, but fundamentally, you're not worried about Ruku doing anything. And this is a good win condition. Jams for six damage a turn. Allows you to keep the Tainted Pact in the graveyard now that you play the Brainstorm uh, with Underworld Breach. Um, could get rid of the Pact if your plan is to just keep this Inquisition and keep firing it off with Underworld Breach. But I like this. Uh, Kroos is going to help empty Riku's hand, and I mean, Pact of Negation could happen here, but then you take Riku's next turn. Yeah, that's all five mana have to be tapped for that Pact. Yeah. It's it the, might be uh, the, the downside to it being free this turn, but, you know, it is worth it in so many scenarios to run that in your deck. Yeah, I mean, I mean, here, I yeah, I'd fire that pact. Otherwise, what are you doing? You're discarding Lurus, and no, you can't because the pact won't do anything down the line. So, yeah, the, you, there's not much you could do. But this is a tap out, and, and Riku was really hoping to draw one of the combo pieces here because that would have been game over, right? Uh, if you didn't cast the pact. But uh, that, that was the option, right? You don't cast pact. It's, okay, I, I'm hoping to draw tainted pact. Or Fasta's Oracle, since that would be game over. But it, it's just, on the average scenario, it's just awful to let the Croxa resolve. So that's why you see there the uh, Riku take that decision. Yeah, it's a 6-6. Six, six. It's going to make you, make you discard over and over. And it looks like there is now a Spell Bomb in Riku's hand, which could have some implications as far as how the rest of this game plays out. I do like this Cling to Dust, though, uh, because if the... A uh, spell bomb does end up in the graveyard. It cannot be recurred by Luris because it will be exiled, most likely. Yeah. Well, get rid well, of that glimpse is the first thing, right? Yeah. Like For, is you that gotta get rid of their escape card, then you get rid of the permanents they can recur with Luris. Yeah. Yeah, that interaction between uh, spell bomb and Luris, like getting to draw extra cards every turn, is really nice. Even here, it should still be an extra card since Sifka. Doesn't have untapped mana. Uh, oh, solve okay. the equation is a really powerful draw, though. That's a good tutor. It's able to get the Tainted Pact into Riku's hand. You gotta also play the Spell Bomb. That doesn't really um, affect the combo, right? Because you go to zero cards in library. But still puts it in play. Still cycles through the library at a cheapish cost. Um, yeah, so so Riku is setting up, especially with Wishclaw Talisman and Pact in hand. Sivka does have the Drown in the Lock, uh, which is a hard counter. So it, Riku, it's really, can Riku find any disruption is really the question here. Yeah, Sivka's got this counter spell at the ready. What Riku would probably like to see is something like a mystical dispute but even then still would need one more mana just to get that working yep keep the drown in the lock as interaction you know there's a tainted pack you know about luris so you're just hoping that the top two cards are not uh interaction plus disruption well there's a fun card tyrant scorn Corn of the Tyrant. We all know that uh, Nicol Bolas likes his corn on the cob and not in a can. Um, would be a card to protect Lurus with more mana, but that's not the case currently. Uh, well, still, I, I suspect we'll see Lurus this turn, just because of how efficient it is. 
Yeah, just keep getting Nat's spell bomb. Yeah. There it is, fresh from the graveyard. Yep. And once the spell bomb's in play, you can protect your Luris too. So, I mean, if Sifka didn't counter the Luris, then probably not going to kill it in a response here, right? You're not going to kill it once your opponent has a card. Sifka made the decision here of Drown and Lock is essentially a hard counter spell. Um, and I'd rather keep that for the combo because Riku has access to Wishclaw Talisman and Taint Pack. And yes, there's a card advantage engine, but there's not much I can do about it. And yeah, not looking for Augur of Bolas here. But that is just a land. Yeah, Sivka's definitely feeling uh, under pressure based on how these plays are, but does get to return Luris um, and play it. I mean, why not? Yeah. Two players hanging out with their cat nightmares. Speaking not going to play the Croxa from the graveyard because it is far more important to stop the combo from landing on Riku's turn. Yeah, but, you know, eliminate now Tyrant Scorn. Mystical Dispute is nice, too. You get mm -hmm. access to even more... Uh, well, it's it's not going to stop Sifka from going off. Sifka drew a lot of lands, has tons of mana, so it's more going to be to kind of uh, protect the combo. It, get, oh, it, wow. can, it can fully protect the combo here. Yeah, yeah. You so, get so, the yeah, Oracle, safe. you pack the Oracle, you've got one extra mana, and it's... All you need to stop a counterspell because all the counterspells are going to be blue, which means that Mystical Dispute will only cost one mana. The, yeah, the, the worst thing that can happen here is that Sivka actually has two pieces of counter magic, so the counterspell plus the Pact of Negation. And if that happens, you know, okay, both packs are burned, but I can um, essentially get one with Mastermind's Acquisition from the sideboard. So it's not, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, and, and Sivka does really need Pact of Negation plus the Counterspell, so I like going for it here, uh, because in most scenarios, winning the game. Yep, and right now, we've got Riku going through every single card in the deck. Just got to click, decline, click, decline. Do not put this into my hand until the deck is exhausted and the Thassa's Oracle Trigger wins the game. And it looks like Sifka is not going to allow Riku that um, kindness of not having to click through. But once the timer burns out, the way the Arena Client works is it will actually automatically decline the future uh, selections. And you can see there, there are two timers left. Because it's fairly late in the game, uh, it's at least turn seven or eight, I believe. Um, maybe even later, is it turn nine? Um you you will see all of these cards just get clicked. There's enough time on the timer, I think. Riku's got a high APM here. Going for that decline, 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 decline. Yeah, it's it's actually quicker to decline than to wait for the, the rope to burn out. Um, there's got to be enough cards left because a card got put in hand here. Oh. But... Yeah, yeah, there's, yep. there's at least two, sure. Yeah, I, 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 I doubt that, based on how that went, I doubt that Riku misclicked for anything there. <laughs> no, it's a, there, there were two cards left. So we're going to take a quick break while these players sideboard getting into game three.
Hi, everybody. I am back here with Eduardo Sajalik. I'm Amy the Amazonian, and we're getting to, we are getting into game three here between Rico Kumagai and Stanislav Sivka. This is a Grixis pack mirror, but just because it's a mirror match doesn't mean the decks are the same. This deck being almost singleton means that there are a lot of different cards to move around. And as we saw there, just the variety of counter spells in the different ways they work. Some of them tax for three, some of them definitely hit. Some of them are nearly uncounterable. Some of them cost zero mana. The variety of ways that turns play out in this deck is so hard to predict. Yeah, and from a play perspective, what makes it really difficult is, you know, you can kind of figure out classes of cards like okay, my opponent probably has a counter spell or a disruption spell, or they've been sitting on this card a while, it's probably just a, a, a removal spell. What What's actually fascinating is if, how, if you can actually figure out a pattern and go, yes, they have exactly this card because of how the game panned out. That's a much harder uh, problem to solve. So Sifka keeping a hand that's got a little bit of ramp in it, uh, interestingly enough, that Mindstone can also be recurrable with the Luris as card draw in the later game. Same with that Soul Guide Lantern. And a future card draw card, Behold. Behold the multiverse you can foretell so you can get some draw two, scry two on turn three. Mm. Yeah, it, it's kind of close here between Mindstone and um, well, like with Soul Guide Lantern. You don't I think get that's to get the best value use of mana. Right? Yeah. Yeah, just use your mana. And you get to behold next turn too. So just play your cards out efficiently. Try to undo your mulligan. Uh get back uh on the cards. From from Riku's and side. Oh, no Do you yeah. see the hope of Giraffer? Because I believe that's what I see in hand. It's hard to tell, uh, but it does have that legendary border. I'm pretty sure I'm looking at a hope of Giraffer. You're looking that at the right card, yes. Nice, that could stop your opponent from comboing off. Yep. Um, not the card you really want in this spot. It's more... It's good if your opponent has a lot of interaction, but uh, a few of the combo pieces, but we're kind of playing in the reverse, right? So when the player on the play is the one that threatens to combo off earlier, but has less resources. They have more time to set up because they can use their mana more each turn. Well, the play on the draw is the one that probably has more interaction. So Hope is, is a card that typically, even though it costs a card, can be better on the play just because of that fact. Oh, and there is the Pact in Riku's hand. Halfway to the combo. Yep. And with Luris in hand, we could see those artifacts recurred in some very close turns. Uh, Riku has a lot more cards that uh, work with Luris of the Dream Den, which is actually a very big difference between these two decks. Is, um, you know, Riku gets to essentially recur cards with Luris much better than Sifka can. There's a Soul Guide Lantern, but that's not a, a typical scenario. Uh, Sifka does have less cards that do recur with the Luris. Yeah, being able to get rid of the Hope of Yerfer from the graveyard will probably be relevant, so it is not recurred and does not stop uh, multiple turns worth of spells. Yeah. Now, it is very unlikely that Riku can win next turn, but there is a possibility if Riku draws a card with the Maze Mind Tome and top decks both an untapped land and uh, Fasa's Oracle. I mean, that would be it. You'd attack with the Hope. There's not much that Sivka has in, in terms of interaction against uh, both Hope and the Hand. By the way, I'm not going to lie, I'm a little jealous that the matches that Cedric and Marshall got to watch mostly featured pack rats. Um, I haven't seen a single rat during our games all weekend. It's okay. I, I still have uh, horrible memories having played a lot of that limited format. <laughs> oh, I do love me a rat. Oh, and limited? It was, uh, it was a gross <laughs> card. <laughs> it was, I, I kept a, in limited, I kept one land pack rat and other cards that didn't matter and... Yeah, hit oh, my yeah, because you discard it and boom, more pack rats. Right, I played yeah. it in a cube, which is a little different, but it still definitely won some games. Now, looking at this game, uh, Wishclaw Talisman, really nice pickup here, um, is going to allow the setup, especially with that land, and the Hope of Girapur is going to make this negate and this spell pierce look really awful. 
like truly horrendous. A as a result, um, I wouldn't be surprised if Riku fired this miscast on the Behold the Multiverse. Um, since Sifka, Sifka does have the mana for the combo easily, so you you know you might want to keep the miscast for the combo, but it is close because. With two 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 cards, especially something like a discard spell, is the only thing you're truly worried about in this spot. And what you know, when Sifka does get to essentially look at up to five fresh cards, I like this though. Just stopping the Wishclaw Talisman. Hope of Garapur is going to make this negate irrelevant on the combo turn anyway. So just countering the setup makes sense. Yes, and for people who haven't played against Hope of Garapur before, the way that you would play it out here is you attack. Once it's dealt damage to your opponent, you sacrifice it. And then until your next turn, your opponent cannot cast non-creature spells, which means no counter spells and no kill spells. There's no real way to interact with the combo at that point. Yeah. And uh, Riku can pass with Brainstorm up, uh, which protects against a discard spell. But I wouldn't be surprised if Sifka spell pierces the um, Brainstorm here in response. I, I I I would be really shocked if I don't see a, if you don't see a spell pierce on brainstorm actually here. Oh, and there's the tainted pact gone, so no longer will the wishclaw talisman be fetching the oracle and winning the game. Yeah, and yeah, you know the hand. I like playing the Luris, I think here just because you get to play the the canyon slough, have a lot of mana. Re start recurring this Mind Stone or this Soul Guide Lantern. Um, and it seems better than Behold the Multiverse. You can always Behold later, it's cheaper. Now, Riku has four mana and none of the combo pieces in hand, so it's not actually possible to, to win this turn. I do like that Luris has some choices. Assuming it is on the battlefield, it might get bounced. I don't think so, though. No. Um, you know, like, bouncing Luris makes sense in some spots, um, especially if your opponent's kind of low on, on mana. That's where you'd want to do it. But unfortunately, uh, both players are low on another resource, just raw cards. Um, and, and Sifka's going to be able to pull ahead here, right? But between having the pro the advantage on the Luris plus the Beholder Multiverse and having just access to more mana right away. Now, you are talking about Hope of Garapur all the time. It is kind. It is going to be a really important card because down, it, it means that there's a class of cards in Sifka's decks that aren't that important. And essentially, Sifka is going to have to look for the combo as rapidly as possible. And he found half of it right there. There's the Tainted Pact in hand. And we're seeing a little, a little look at the graveyard there. Some considerations to be made. Riku does have the Luris in hand, which means that there may be some cards recurred from the graveyard. So getting this Soul Guide Lantern ready to sacrifice is a great proactive play. Right. You might you get to get rid of the of the sphere. You get to make sure the Luris doesn't draw cards. Now, from Sifka's perspective, this is a really scary spot because Riku has access to Wishclaw Talisman. So if either of the combo pieces gets drawn, it, it's Sifka can't even bluff. Because oh, yeah. that, there's, there's nothing. You'd need to already have something on the battlefield that can interact. If you had, uh, say, an artifact with an activated ability that would allow you to interrupt the combo, not that there's one now, um, <laughs> that's where it would have to happen. Yeah. I mean, Sifka does get to draw multiple cards a turn ahead of Riku, which is a big advantage. Also, that Castle Ventress, um, you know, I mean, if Riku... The Riku Kuma guy does have access to a Luris of the Dream Den. So it is better generally to draw than to scry. But with the Soul Guide Lantern, it does get counter closed since, after all, this uh, spell bomb might get exiled. 
And there is now a drown in the lock in hand who's got some counterplay available. Yeah. It, it's actually kind of close. Like, uh, the counterplay you mentioned is really valuable, but also we could just get rid of this Lurist. Yeah, kill it. Uh, that, that's actually one thing with Soul Guide Lantern specifically. It would be a much more popular sideboard card than it is if you could choose which graveyard to exile. Uh, you know, just because of rogues. <laughs> so that was one of the problems with Soul Guide Lantern is you specifically can't exile your own things. It's a tough call, though. Um, to get rid of the Lurist rather than um, just having this as an interaction piece, since after all, if Sivka draws the combo, you want access to it. Um... When there comes the Drown, with only... Oh, with two mana up, that miscast is not looking all too useful. It, it'll save your Lurus this turn, right? Because it does tax for three. Yep. Yeah, the miscast is perfect here. Great, great card to have access to here. Uh, stops the drown in the lock, and you could still draw your combo piece and win the game. Um, is oh. that the combo piece? Uh <laughs> no, but it is it is a pack rat, and with all mass removal removed from the game, that's a that's a nice little card to have. I think we're going to see the soul guide lantern cycled, replayed, hit the spell bomb that's in Riku's graveyard first. I mean, every draw step in this game is, is so close, right? Like, so, so when you're talking about Soul Guide Lantern exiling the spell bomb, you're, you're right on it because it's essentially cutting Riku Kumagai's ability to keep on par with cards. It, honestly, if it wasn't for that Castle Ventress, uh, Riku would be quite far behind. But the existence of that card is is allowing Riku to really be in this game since even drawing a blank, you get to scry two and you have Wishclaw Talisman and Sifka is not going to have a lot of interaction against you. Yes, and while scrying isn't as powerful as drawing cards, it's still, it's pretty beneficial. It, it can help you a lot in filtering your deck, especially when you are running a combo, just trying to get to those essential pieces. So we're seeing the Maze Mind Tome activated, drawing a card. There's another piece of instant speed, actually, graveyard removal there. Love to see a cling to dust just in case, or use it for some card draw here. Going to take out the Tainted Pact so a Underworld Breach cannot recur it. And now is the time for the rat. Is it time for the rat? Uh, just one. Just one. Come on. Uh, I need to see it. Oh, no. We're, instead, we are seeing a pass. And that is still that is still good because it means that the Tainted Pact, I believe this is the first, could still be cast to look for a card. If, say, uh, they were faced with an Inquisition of Kozilek, which I see <laughs> right there. Yeah. The the problem is you would uh, that you're facing with a plain pact in response to Inquisition of Kozilek, um, and you're correct in identifying that Sivko is probably aiming to play that pact. Is that you kind of have to keep a four mana spell or a land, and neither of those is really that appealing. Um, there's not a ton in the deck, so what are you even trying to hit? So so it is really close, but uh, the problem is if you fire off this tainted pact. You're trying to get a four mana spell. You could instead recur your Soul Guide Lantern, keep drawing, and uh, you have a Pack Rat too. Like, look, if your Tainted Pack gets taken, maybe your plan is just draw cards and have this uh, this alternative game plan. Pack Rat does. It takes a little while, but it will close the game in two or three turns. Yes. Which win condition do you want to stop? Of the rat or the pact. So it looks like Sifka is going to be casting Tainted Pact here to dig for a higher cost. Oh no, a higher cost spell. But what just happened there was the first spell exiled was a Tainted Pact, which means that all the Tainted Pacts are going to be out of the oh. library. And there's the Underworld Breach, which is just going to get discarded here. Yeah, It can get yeah. replayed by Lurus. It is an enchantment. Yeah. So, but that's still not where you want to see it. 
I, I mean, it's it's still pretty nice. Riku Kuma guy can't deal with Lura, so yeah, you basically get us a, a hard tutor for Underworld Breach, and that's a good spot. You get to uh, you know recur that. Now, there's not a ton of cards in the graveyard. Uh, you can sacrifice the Mind Stone and the Soul Guide Lander to get more effects. Uh, so if you if your plan was to fire off the Tainted Pack, you'd still be fine. So this is allowing Sifka to kind of have a Tainted Pack copy card, uh, no matter what. You know. Um, now you could Tainted Pack multiple times, right? You could Tainted Pack, get to Oracle, cast Oracle. Uh, so let's see. Actually, there's eight mana rights. You Underworld Breach. You tainted packed, you get fast as Oracle, you get fast as Oracle, and then yeah, it's actually that's game potentially. R it's Riku Kuma guy has to if if the hope of Giraper doesn't get sacrificed. Um well the right? problem with hope it's it's only on your turn, but you have a wish claw talisman. So Riku Kuma guy, I mean both of the packs are gone, so you could force Mastermind's acquisition. You could use this wish claw talisman. And I is the Soul Guide Lantern been used? Because you could get that. You could get a Soul Guide Lantern and exile that graveyard, so it's not quite game. It's because it could be that you're seeing this Wish Clock Talisman getting used. Um, if there is a Soul Guide Lantern in there, I, I think, yeah, there there's is. Gotta be, yeah, there's got to be, yeah, there's got to be pieces of graveyard hate. There's one right there. Yeah, and, and that's the two packs. So now you need to get a Mastermind's Acquisition. Um, but realistically, I think it's pack rat time. Yeah. The win condition, well, the enabler for the win condition, the win condition itself is Thassa's Oracle, but the enabler is now completely gone. There is no way to access it, which means that this Lurus and this rat are about to become best buddies. And look, there's a thought tease, a way to get rid of the Lurus that's been sitting in Riku's hand for so long. Yep. Might as well get rid of it. Um, you're not really trying to force through any anything anymore. You get to draw a card, so you'll have plenty of fuel for the pack rat. <laughs> yeah. The the fact, though, that Soul Guide Lantern gets to kind of remove that Underworld uh, Breach before, you know, without having to sacrifice and actually remove the whole graveyard is a big plus. Yeah. We're seeing the Luris... Deal three damage, gain three life here. And it's amazing to see a combo deck transform into a, a little bit of a counterplay creature deck here. Um, by the way, there is a big cost of playing Grixis. Um, you notice all those blue-red uh, dual lands over there? <gasps> yeah, there's a reason why that Lurus hasn't landed. It's not just because it hasn't been a good play. It's also been because there's not double black on Riku's side of the battlefield. In order to get singletonized lands they're making some sacrifices as far as their mana base goes and what that means is playing a lot of check lands shock lands that have off color mana on them and uh you can see that sometimes it just doesn't quite work out in lining up your colors right yeah. and, <laughs> and this is by already. the way this is like a true singleton as far as the mana base goes there are two copies of pact in the deck some of the lists I've seen uh, also will run two copies of Oracle or other similar two ofs. But if you look at these mana bases, they can't have two islands. They have to have one island and then, say, ten other different blue sources. Yeah, that's why you have Breeding Pool. It's just untapped <laughs> islands that sometimes I have to take two, right? It's like island with drawback. Uh, yeah. I mean, we got our black source for Lurus, uh, but that means we can't fire off the Spotsies. Let's see, though. Like, that's eight mana. We get to start scrying with Castle Vantress. Um, yeah, but I like this. Get rid of the graveyard. You get to recur that Soul Guide Lantern down the line anyways. And the Hope of Giraper is swinging in there. And that can be sacrificed and brought back each turn thanks to Lurus. Well, it can't be sacrificed each turn. Well, I guess you can, but it wouldn't do anything. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> it's 
You can't you play spells. Yeah, you have to deal damage with it to enable its effect. Yeah. Um, also, oh, we haven't I seen think. the Wish Cloth Talisman get used because, you know, Sifka wants to do it. That Solve the Equation would be good game, except that the first Tainted Pact exiled the second one. And I don't think there's enough mana for Solve, Mastermind, Pact, Oracle, and Wish Cloth. That seems like a lot of cards. That's uh, quite the chain that would be required there. Yeah. Oh, and thoughts using a thoughts is classic gameplay there. I mean, look, at the end of the day, Riku Kuma guy doesn't have the opportunity to draw extra cards. Let's just make some 4 4 rats and, and get in there. I'm, I'm sure Marshall is watch. If Marshall's watching this match, I'm sure he's screaming, pack, rat, pack. <laughs> rat, pack, rat. I mean, I'm here for the rat. So this pack rat, by the way, uh, it grows and grows as the board does. So pack rat looks to all other pack rats as friends. And it says, hello, my fellow pack rat. You give me strength and help me grow as a rodent. And each other pack rack says to sit says the same. And they can even bring more friends from home. They say, hey, you know that land in hand? Pfft, yeah, I'm not using it. You want to throw it away and go get coffee? Awesome. New friend, new rat, bigger rat. Time to hit face. Yeah. The part I love, by the way, is uh, technically it counts any rat. Um, oh, so, yeah. So you want to you... play burglar rat? Ooh, that's a rat. You want to play rat colony? Rat right there. I'm trying to think about it. There was a one mana vermin from the set where pack rat was printed, and you basically played in your deck as a pack rat glorious anthem. Oh, beautiful. I, I've, saw, I've seen many decks that were 37 swamps, two pack rats, and one, uh, and one vermin. I'm really hoping that we get a return to Kamigawa that just has Return of the Rats. Because there were a whole bunch of legendary rats in Kamigawa, and really, as you can see here from Pack Rat, we need more rat support. This is the deck that people should be building, Rat Tribal. I mean, right now we got Rat Tribal, and uh, look, Sivka had to lose all the combo pieces, but in all that interaction, there's one, there, there is a hero left. <laughs> and it is Pack Rat. I think we've actually seen as many games get won by Pack Rat as by Pact on coverage. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe it's I just mean, because I mean, these are the games that last longer, so they're more notable. They really stick with us. Yeah, and the and honestly, the thing with Pact Rat is it, it's just a card. You only have to have a card in your deck, and it enables this, right? Like, imagine if Sifka didn't have it. It'd be just some other random interaction cyborg card. It certainly wouldn't allow this to happen. Oh, and yeah, we're watching Riku dig, and there's the Thassa's Oracle, but there's still plenty of cards left in the deck here. That is going to be victory for Sifka and the Rats. Yeah, yeah, there Riku's only out was to draw. Uh, if there was a Tainted Pack left, draw the Tainted Pack, hope that Thassa's Oracle was near the bottom. But yeah, no, the, the Rats take it home. Sifka... Winning it, taking it home with the power of the rodents. That is some excellent gameplay, if you ask me. I'm very happy to see, um, finally, we get to witness the rat victory. We get to see the power of discarding extra cards to turn them into rats. I, I mean, it, it speaks volumes to how powerful... like. Adding the card to your sideboard, it's just a win condition in a can, right? All you need is that one card, and all of a sudden you can completely turn the game around because there's no sweepers. If the spot removal spell isn't ready on time, it's just going to take over the game. And, you know, when both players are interacting a bunch, something like Pack Rat can really completely break a game wide open. Oh, absolutely. I am very happy that we got to witness that game. And by the way, that was just... The first name for the round. We're going to be taking a break and then coming back to watch another match.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the League Weekend coverage. I'm Amy the Amazonian here with Eduardo Sedgelik, and we're going to be going into another match of historic in this Strixhaven split. We've got two all-stars here, by the way, and not a single rat to be seen. What a shame. I mean, it's okay. There's a graveyard theme in in this matchup, but it's a matchup we've seen both decks already, Just Got Control and Is It Phoenix. But we've kind of seen Is It Phoenix having to always go against the pack deck, and, and that was a little tragic, let's put it this way. It, it ended in some games which looked like a beating, a one-sided beating. So it's nice to see Phoenix in a matchup where, okay, I'm deciding to bring a bunch of Dovin's Vetoes and, and uh, Planeswalkers to fight the uh, Demir pack decks. Oh, you're playing um, hmm, Hasty Frets and Recursion. And uh, okay, that might be tough. The the one thing that's going to be the most interesting card is going to be Narset Parter of Veils. You're you're almost never going to Narset not minusing is not something you see often, but it is so good against the Phoenix deck. Yeah, you want to keep her alive yeah. as long as you can, and if she dies to a single attack from a Phoenix, if she has minused before. Why do you want Narset though? In case people aren't familiar with her nasty passive. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I, the thing is, Phoenix, I have Brainstorm, draw three cards, put two on top. I have Faithless Looting, draw two, discard two. Uh, wait a second, wait, I can't draw more than one card each turn. Wait, this is not going to go well for me. Um, yeah, you have to cast all those spells, but if half of them say something like draw three, put two back, draw two, discard two, they just turn into, assuming you're playing them on your turn after you've already drawn your card for the turn so you can attack, they turn into discard two. Or, or put two cards back into your deck. It is not what you want to be doing if you are a Phoenix deck. So Marcia's deck has these big planeswalkers, Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. That is the card that helps control the game and helps you keep up counterspell mana. But counterspells are not as big in this matchup because Phoenixes almost never get cast. They go to the graveyard, they get discarded, and then they get recurred just naturally. They get brought back to the battlefield at the start of combat if you've cast three or more turn cards, sorry, three or more instants or sorceries in the turn. Exactly. The the cards that actually matter in this matchup are, funnily enough, some of the more expensive cards. Obviously, there's the Narsets that are a Stone Cold Bomb, pretty much. But Torrential Gearhulk is also an all-star. The Phoenix deck can't really do much against it. It does lock up the vein quickly, and with something like Magma Opus, you get to kind of wipe whatever the Phoenix player did, and then you present nine damage and bodies on the board, plus whatever kind of might have been left from the Magma Opus. So that can be over in two quick attacks, plus Lightning Helix. So that's the thing is, the Phoenix deck has to go really fast. You can't let your opponent go Magma Opus with the Treasure, Torrential Gear Hulk, because that's going to be hard to come back from. It's also a really fun interaction. There's also Mizzix Mastery in that list, by the way, which we haven't seen that much of this weekend, which can do mass spell recursion from the graveyard. And now here is Javier Dominguez's Is It Phoenix list. Got some beautiful baby dragons, those sprite dragons, which get bigger and bigger as more and more spells are cast. Young Pyromancer makes the board wide each time an instant or sorcery is cast. And the Stormwing Entity gets a discount and scry from spells. Right. Stormwing Entity going to be a little weak, unfortunately, in this matchup because it doesn't match well against something like Lightning Helix unless you have a ton of mana. But yeah, you got it. Sprite Dragon, Arc Like Phoenix, sometimes Young Pyromancer. Those are the key threats. And it really is going to be about Javier being able to find those Phoenixes, discard them to a Faceless Looting, and, you know, go all the way. Uh, the cards are going to matter. That one copy of Mystical Dispute is an all-star if Javier gets to draw it. Being able to counter a Teferi or a Torrential Gear Hulk before it becomes a problem, might as well be Time Walk. And when you get to get extra turns with this deck, you really get to uh, close out the game very fast. Yeah, until they get to sideboarding, that is the only counter spell available to Javier. So he has to be on the aggro game plan. Thankfully, these Phoenixes do have haste. Same with the Sprite Dragon. So if a Planeswalker is sitting unprotected on the board, it can be smacked down to size. Exactly. So, yeah. And, and that's the thing is having these frets to make sure the planeswalkers don't stick around important. That's why you don't minus Narset. The last play pattern you want to do 
is play Narset minus, and then your opponent just casts Arc like Phoenix and gets rid of it because Narset is just way more powerful in this matchup. Uh, Post board, watch out for Scorching Dragon Fire since that allows interaction as well with Teferi. Oh, hey, you're talking about getting those mystical disputes bright and early. Look at Javier's hand. There are two disputes here. We are in game two, uh, which is why, by the way, post sideboarding, you get a couple extra counter spells available. Yep. And uh, not really much in the way of aggression, but, you know, with the op, the iteration, and the lootings, Javier will get to go deep, pretty deep in the deck and just have a key turn with Mystical Dispute up to avoid something like a Teferi, a Narset, or uh, a Torrential Gear Hulk uh, with a Magma Opus. And there's a Spire Bluff Canal. It can only come in untapped now. You don't want to wait too long on that. But there are three spells which could be cast here, but with no phoenixes in hand, that does get a little bit awkward. You really want the Faithless Looting to have at least one phoenix already as a target. Uh, you can't just hope to draw one. Yeah. And, and also, you know, didn't cast the Expressive Iteration just because it wasn't going to be really strong last turn. You would, you would have to discard anyways, and you don't really want to fire off a Faithless Looting. So it was really going to be draw one card. And there was a possibility for Marset then and slam a Narset potentially. So we see it here when you get access to more cards, you know what you want. Yeah, that Scorching Dragonfire can remove one of the Phoenixes or possibly a Stormwind entity from the game. Or a Sprite Dragon. Hey, Sprite Dragon. These are so cute. And we're seeing double. Uh, double dragons on that iteration, one going to hand and one going back into the deck. And unfortunately, there is a discard here for Javier. Too much card advantage. Yeah, and and that really came down to essentially that Sulfur Falls being tapped means you, you need to keep up a Mystical Dispute for the Planeswalkers. Yeah, and there is no... There's no island or mountain in play yet. These are all non-basic lands and non-shocks. Yep. Fire off Brainstorm. It still gets you a few cards deeper anyways. And um, you, Javier's constricting resource right now is mana. It's not really cards. So trying to just convert Brainstorm, get a card deeper. Strategic planning also helping you get a little bit deeper into the deck, possibly put some phoenixes in the graveyard, but not a single phoenix to be found. May as well get the land so possibly some actions can be taken in the future, like playing out a Storwing Entity and holding up the Spell Pierce or Dispute. Yeah. So, so one thing to note is that um, Javier's counter spells are much more powerful than Marcio's, since Marcio can't really stop a lot of Javier's frets. Uh, whereas uh, Javier's can. And Marshall's spells are also much more expensive. Now, this is an infinite, right? At some point, the disputes do uh, become losing propositions because Marshall got infinite time, got to set up lands. But as you see, Marshall's hand is just full of answers. Uh, but if a fret was drawn, I mean, what are you going to do? Cast it into dispute? This is powerful, though. Yes, yeah, so we now have two spells cast this turn, two phoenixes in the graveyard... Waiting to see if something else happens. No, nope. I mean, you could have flashback Faithless Looting, but then that shields down. Yep, so... you can't do that. We know that Marsu does not have any Teferis in hand. It does have the Scorching Dragonfire, though, which is a bit of a threat against those Phoenixes. A little curious about not even seeing the Stormwing Entity land. I guess holding up two different counter spells because there's so much mana now. There's enough mana for Marcio to play a Teferi, have a counter spell ready, and protect it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the mystical disputes up make it trivially easy to to have an answer to a potential Teferi. Um, now, on Javier's side, this Narset is more likely to minus. It does die to Lightning Helix, but there's also Fry, and preventing your opponent from drawing cards has much a much lower value. <laughs> and a whiff oh, sorry, from yeah, Narset, seeing a Stormwing Entity and three lands. Those are the lands that got dug for earlier in the game. That is not great. Yeah. Yeah. Does not feel good. But that's how powerful Narset is. You've missed, and you uh, traded one for one? 
oh yeah, you have to get rid of it because otherwise cards like, say, Brainstorm <laughs> would be so miserable to play. Yeah, yeah. and uh, at this point, Marcia has dispute. Ah, and the first Teferi has been cited, and also the Magma Opus. Magma Opus is a great card in this deck we mentioned before, being able to flash it back with the Gear Hulk. Uh, it can also just be cast straight from the hand. Because we're getting so late into the game, that is a possibility. Yeah. I wonder how much of a read Marceau has on uh, Javier's hand, because Javier has pretty deliberately always left mana up. So... That that already doesn't incentivize you to fire off this Teferi. And I'm just not surprised to to see like uh have you not keep it. So yeah. Ah, it's another one of the Phoenixes. Three Phoenixes in the graveyard, three spells cast. So it is. Oh, and an Ox of Agonis also getting discarded for the future. Time to brainstorm. Yeah, hope to hit a blue source rather than a red one. Since again, uh, a look mountain. Look at the sand. I mean, it's all blue, yeah. and that doesn't even need to resolve because it's it's really just filtering. Yeah. And Here we go. Call to the third. We've got three arc light phoenixes. These are hasty three twos in the air, and they swing in for nine damage. One of them's going to get exiled by the scorching dragon fire. Is another one going to be killed by the helix? Nope. The other two are going to get their damage in and then sit peacefully. Yeah. Now we're going to see Marceau fire this off because you get to pay for one dispute. Um, Javier, though, is going to fire off dispute and probably spell pierce here. Um, since that taps out Marceau, it does get rid of the treasure, so it makes the next dispute even better. Even though you're trading two cards with Teferi, if that resolves, you are kind of forced to do that anyways. And using up that spell pierce while it's still very relevant uh, before everybody has tapped out. So another hasty flyer here. The sprite dragon hitting the battlefield, followed by faithless looting to grow that sprite dragon. And, oh, that Narset is a great get. Yeah, allows you to, to keep things going if Marcio has the top deck. So, so that's also why you see the, you know, the dispute discarded, even though it is a relevant card, just because we have access to Narset part of our veils. So here's the question, will she whiff? No! Narset actually finding three great options here. Options. See, because it's an option. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. I'll be here, uh, I'll be here all night. <laughs> you might be, depending on how uh, the, <laughs> the, the top of the standings shake out and we get a playoff. <laughs> that is true. We might end up going to tiebreakers for the Rivals League. That'd be that'd be sweet, like a match for world championship, on a, a bonus match. Let's put it that way. We're seeing an opt here, trying to see. Hmm, is it worth it for me to get this faithless looting? Nope, going to rely on these birds and the life gain off those lightning helixes is relevant here. Yep, uh, since uh, Javier is firing a lot of spells pre-combat, which is going to make it harder for these phoenixes to, uh, for a phoenix to come back since it'll just go away to lightning helix. We're seeing these counter spells get discarded. Or sorry, not discarded, put back into the library. And it's time for the ox. Going to drop the brazen borrower and the land. You have to exile eight cards from your graveyard. And now those cards that were put on top of the library with Brainstorm will be drawn. Yeah, that, that's actually a really interesting use of Brainstorm, putting the cards that you want to conserve on the top of your library. And also now there's a 5-3 on the battlefield. Even more great creatures here. I do think that the, the Borrower just really would have been another flyer. It had the potential to bounce the token from Magma Opus. That's true. Like, you, you do get to get more pressure that way, but fundamentally, Javier has more than enough, right? You mentioned the five free ox. That's a good piece of pressure. Yeah, that's going to um, make some waves here. And Magma Opus is the only option that Marcio has this turn. It is instant speed, so it's probably going to be cast mid-combat, is my guess, because of the recursion of the phoenixes. But it can still be countered. You see, uh, Javier did a quick land count there. There is exactly eight mana 
under Marcia's control, which is exactly enough to cast the opus and not deal with the mystical dispute. Exactly. It was kind of interesting that Marcio could have used that on upkeep, which is a tra traditional time you'd kind of do it. Um, just because you, Javier has the, the lowest amount of cards. Um, but that would be an extra spell for a Phoenix now with the Sprite Dragon. You probably want to do it in response to the iteration just because it gives Javier the smallest chance of getting a counter spell if there isn't one. Nope, letting that resolve. Now there are lands aplenty. Another non-creature spell going to buff up the Sprite Dragon. By the way, when that Mystical Dispute gets cast, it is going to make the Sprite Dragon even bigger and going to line up for even more lethal. Yeah. Like, it's but, lethal now, it'll be more lethal. Yeah. By the way, that's one of the biggest difference, I think, with Sprite Dragon, is the, the fact that it doesn't say instant or sorcery. It's just like, you, you know, any non-creature spell is cool yeah, with me. Yeah, there, there was this whole cycle of these non-creature spells, or spells that found non-creatures to be important, including the Narset from Ikoria, she um, she was able to generate mana that could only be used on non-creature spells and ended up uh, doing quite nicely. So this Magma Opus would have killed creatures, tapped creatures, generated card draw and a token, but instead it's going to be countered. Yep. And, I mean, look, Marcio ends this game uh, losing to all these creatures, but also with no cards in hand. Have you did a good job of you don't have to be aggressive against these control decks. They, they're loaded with answers. If you can get rid of the Planeswalkers and make sure that the control deck never generates card advantage,